Today's hymn selection is I Need Thee Every Hour, written by Annie Hawks. She had a talent for writing poetry and even had some of her poems published in the newspaper when she was just 14 years old. She married and joined the Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, where Dr. Robert Lowry was pastor. He was responsible for composing hundreds of hymns, including Nothing But the Blood, Low in the Grave He Lay, Shall We Gather at the River, and the refrain to Marching to Zion. He recognized her talent and encouraged her to use it. He even offered a challenge, saying, If you'll write the words, I'll write the music. The inspiration for her text came one day as a 37-year-old wife and mother. She had a sense of nearness to Jesus, and the words, I need thee every hour, came to her mind. She immediately composed the words to the hymn almost as they are today. Her pastor added the tune and refrain. It was first published and used at the National Baptist Sunday School Convention in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1872. You'll notice that each of the first four verses address a different aspect of our dependence on God. First, our need for his peace. Second, our inability to resist temptation alone. Third, our need to find true meaning in life. And fourth, our desire to see God's promises fulfilled. The fifth verse is a plea for God's Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. I invite you to sing out loud as the music plays and the words are displayed on the screen.
Now, here's Pastor Brian's message. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you again on this Sunday, and we are really appreciative of you joining with us. We pray that things are going well for you and your family, and that you're able to find ways to occupy yourself in this shelter-at-home time. Before we get into the Word of God again, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this Lord's Day that you've given us once again to focus on you, to focus on your Son, to focus on how much you love us and care for us and care about us. What a wonderfully awesome God you are as we think about your majesty in all of your splendor and glory, the creation that you put together and all of the things that scripture says about how majestic and mighty and awesome you are it's difficult for us to comprehend and then to think that you are mindful of us that you care about us that you love us especially once we rebelled and we brought sin into the picture and you didn't give up on us you sent your son to redeem us wow lord we just love you and thank you and we worship you for that we pray for everyone who is facing this pandemic in one way or another. We especially pray for those on what's known as the front lines, the medical people and oftentimes military units who are helping to provide food and, and others who are serving right up close to this, uh, this virus, helping people, taking care of people, providing for people. We, we pray for them that you give them strength. They're working extra hard. They're working extra hours and they're, they're, they're worn down. Lord, we, we pray for them that you would strengthen them and also protect them from the virus. They're exposed to it. For people who work at pharmacies and grocery stores and other essential services, Lord, we pray for their strength and their protection. We thank you for them. We pray for families isolated at home, but especially for those who are in a home with no one else. They're there as a single. And Lord, how especially difficult that must be. And we ask you to comfort them, remind them of your presence, remind them of your love. And we pray that they could look to you and that they could feel your presence in certain special ways as you just reveal yourself to them. You have so many ways of doing that. And Lord, we just uh, pray for your gift of patience and your gift of endurance and perseverance as we work through this difficult and challenging time. We, we just lift up everyone in every unique circumstance. And we thank you for your grace that has seen us through. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be back in the 139th Psalm again. We started this last Sunday. We said that there are four sections of this Psalm. And it, more than any other Psalm, perhaps, this Psalm through these sections links us with our personal God. We have a tendency to feel that God is distant from us, or at least we're distant from Him, and especially when maybe we've lived a day that hasn't been pleasing to Him, or we've gone through an experience of some kind of carnality or failure, or like now, when we're living in a time when everything seems to be upended in our life, our circumstance is beyond our control. And this psalm reminds us of how closely we are linked with our Father God. We began looking at this psalm. You might recall from last time it answers four questions. You'll notice it has 24 verses sep separated into four sections or stanzas if you want to think of it like a hymn. Each stanza has six verses, each one answering one of these questions about you and God. You may recall the first question, verses 1 through 6. The question is, how well does God know me? And we were really encouraged last time when we found that God knows us completely. In fact, it says he knows me when I sit down, verse 2, and when I get up. It says in verse 3, he scrutinizes my path. He's intimately acquainted with all of my ways. In fact, he knows every word on my tongue, verse 4, and he knows it even before I say it. And the thought is God knows us completely. He knows us thoroughly. We're not removed from him. He knows everything about us. Nothing happened yesterday that surprised God. Nothing will happen today that God didn't know about from the foundation of the world. Nothing has ever happened in your life that caught God off guard or caused him to say, oh, wow, didn't see that coming. 
God is never surprised. He knows all about us. He knows us thoroughly. Then the second question, verses 7 through 12. Okay, God knows me, but is God close to me? You may think, I live in, on earth, God lives in heaven, never the twain shall meet. Well, that's wrong. How close is God to me? Look again, verse 7, very quickly. Where could I possibly go that would get me away from his presence, from his spirit? And then David names a number of opposites. If I go to heaven, will I find God there? If I go to the grave, he's there as well. If I take the rays of the morning dawn or go to the remotest part of the sea, God is still there. He's as close as my shadow. Because actually, as a child of God, God in his spirit lives inside of me. So if unless I can get away from myself, how can I get away from God? As somebody once said, nearer, still nearer, nearer we cannot be. For in the person of his son, we are as near as he. Christ is as close to God as he possibly can be because it's a triune God. God's spirit is in us through Christ. So how close is God to us? He lives inside of us. In fact, verse 12 even says, the darkness doesn't cover us up and keep God from seeing us. So if we fear that in the darkness of our times, since God can have no association with evil, that maybe in the darkness of our times he'll lose sight of us, that somehow the darkness of our age will cover us from his view, no chance. The one who made the darkness, see what it says? Darkness hides nothing. That's why it says, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness is like light to you. Now then, if it's true that God knows me so thoroughly, and if it's true that God is completely close to me all the time, as close as my own skin, well then the third question comes, how well, how carefully, did God make me? I think it links itself to these other two. How well does God know me? Well, if he made me, he must know me pretty well. If he knows me that well, maybe it's because he made me. And how close is God to me? Well, if he's as close as that, and if there's nowhere I can be apart from him, then he must have been around very close to me when I was created. Because again, if there's no place that's away from his presence, well, that would certainly include my mother's womb, right? I want to say something before we get into this third question. In my opinion, this section of the Bible is one of the most unique in all of the Bible. And I'm not exaggerating that just to keep your attention. I mean that. This passage is unbelievably intimate in looking at a place that until just recently, really, in human history, no eye had ever seen. Remember, this passage was written before there were such things like obstetricians and ultrasounds and all those biological science things that helped us to see in there. This was written before there was much known on earth about the unborn fetus. This was written in a day when that nine-month pregnancy period was a mystery for the most part. I want you to see in this section how the Spirit of God talks about us so completely in those days before our birth. And I want to say something else about this just in general. You don't know but what maybe in the days to come you could use this passage to encourage somebody, some individual, some couple wrestling with the so-called problem of birth defects and other pro-choice dilemmas that they're called. This passage relates to every child in the womb regardless. So we're talking about the same God who knows us, who is always with us, and now we're going to relate it to the God who made us. Let's look at it very carefully. Verse 13, for it was you, God, who formed my inward parts. Now, I don't want to be overly busy with this, but I don't want to overlook anything that's important here. The first word ties it in with the previous verse, the darkness and the light they're just alike to God. And to prove the point, the psalmist goes to the place of pre-birth darkness down in the womb of the mother. And even there, God, you formed, you saw, you were there. The word you in the Hebrew text is really strong. You, Lord, no one else but you, you, you yourself alone, no one else formed. The word means to originate. How often in our day, uh, birth is looked upon as just a common happening in the world, 
or unfortunately as an accident or an inconvenience. How often people today look at pregnancy as, oh man, why did this happen to us? The psalmist is saying a lot more, but he's saying this. He's saying there's no reason to ever feel that way about any child, either one born to you or your own birth, for God and no one else originated, formed, put together my inward parts. Literally, the word, the word means kidneys. You know, for you, Lord, you alone, you form my kidneys. But obviously, God formed more than that. The point is that God, in this prenatal state, when we were just that tiny little speck, so they say about the size of a period at the end of a sentence, God immediately went to work forming all of those vital organs on the inside of us, our kidneys, our heart, our lungs, everything. And the psalmist says, Lord, you and no one but you originated those vital inner organs of my body. I love this phrase, you knit me together in my mother's womb. That's a great translation of the word because it is the idea of knitting something or weaving something together. Lord, you have weaved, you have knitted together my vital organs, my inward parts, and you put me together that intricately. In verse 14, he has to pause and just say, wow, and render thanksgiving to God. Maybe you're like that sometimes. You get a hold of a truth and you just can't go on any further until you stop and say, oh, wow, thanks, Lord. That is so great. Thanks for showing me that. Thanks for revealing that to me. That happens in personal Bible study. I hope you've had that experience where you just spontaneously have to stop and say, wow, Lord, that's marvelous. Thank you for, sh I'm, I'm overwhelmed when I consider what you're showing me. And that's what the psalmist does in verse 14. I praise you, Lord, because you're making me realize how fearfully and wonderfully made I am. Wonderful are your works, and that I know very well. If you ever make a study of the human body, you do realize how fearfully and wonderfully made you are. The muscle system alone is phenomenal. Some muscles interweaving with others, going through one another, so to speak, but still working together and yet independent and yet working together. If you've ever watched some of the events in the Olympics, you've been reminded of the body and its coordinated movements. And it's a beautiful, graceful thing to watch those athletes do what they do. This mass of muscle and bone and blood and nerve all wrapped around with skin. It is fantastic to see it in action. I came across this, talk about being fearfully made. I understand that today your heart will beat on average 103,000 times. Your blood will travel about 168,000 miles. You will breathe roughly 23,000 times. You will inhale approximately 438 cubic feet of air. And you'll speak an average of 36,000 words. Well. Some maybe more than that, some maybe not so many. But you'll move 750 major muscles and you'll use 7 million brain cells today. You and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's what the psalmist is saying. And the marvelous part about it all, if you think about it, God's design is such that it doesn't need prompting. Aren't you thankful that as you go through the day, you don't have to say, okay, heart, beat, no, no, beat again. Okay, now, ooh, beat again, lungs, breathe, breathe, come on, diaphragm, up, down. <gasps> I mean, you'd be a really busy person. Those things just do that automatically. Years ago, when I was thinking through this text, I talked to a medical doctor who was also a good friend, and it was just a fascinating conversation as I asked him, you know, I said, Dr. Smith, what's, what is it down there inside the heart? What is it when you go down in there that regularly it just makes it go boom, boom, boom? And he said, it's a miraculous little nerve center of electricity. He said, it's, it's just a marvel. There's just a spark in there that just sets it off and sets it off and sets it off. And it just keeps your heart pumping all day, all night, night and day, week after week, year after year. And according to this that I looked up, 103,000 times every day it does that. 
Now, the quickest way to crack up is to try to st sit there and count all that, so don't do that. Just be like the psalmist who said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and I praise you, Lord, for that tiny little electrical spark thing that goes off in my heart regularly and moves it, causing to pump, and all that other stuff that goes on, and I don't even have to think about it. It is a marvelous design. Now, he's going way back into those earliest hours of, conce of conception, and that's why I say this is such a unique passage. He slips into it right now in verse 15 as he goes all this way back. Remember verse 13, it was you who formed my inward parts, knitting me together. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you. That word frame has re reference to your skeleton, the bone part of your structure. That was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret. The idea here, secret, is not, it was a secret thing, we were trying to keep it secret because we were ashamed of it. No, it's just something hidden. I can't see it. I can't find it. In fact, it's mentioned down in the latter part of the verse as being in the depths of the earth. Scholars have debated what that means, but having recently spent some time in the first couple of chapters of Genesis, I wonder, and this is just an opinion, but I wonder if we're back to the close association between the word for earth, which is Adama, and the name of the first human, Adam. I wonder if it might be the psalmist thought that when he says, my frame was not hidden from you, my skeleton was not concealed from you, I was formed in a secret place inside the depths of the human known as my mother, the Adama, the Adam of my mother. I just wonder if that's what he has in mind as he says, I was intricately woven in those depths. And those words intricately woven, it's really one Hebrew word that means variegated, which is the idea of a lot of different colors. It's the exact same Hebrew word used in Exodus when they talk about the embroidery work that was done to build, to make the tapestries that were going to be hung in the tabernacle, full of color, woven together with all kinds of designs and, and patterns and embroidery. It's the exact same word. Except here, of course, we're not talking about tabernacle drapery. We're talking about the human body, the inside of it. And the psalmist says, Lord, you embroidered me so that my insides resemble that fine tapestry that hung in the tabernacle. It's full of color, it's full of design, it's full of pattern. And if you'll allow me, let, let's put it together in verse 15. It would sort of read like this. You can follow along. My skeleton, my bones were not hidden from you as I was being made in that concealed place within my mother's womb. My veins, arteries, muscles were embroidered together with various colors like fine needle point. That's what he's saying. Okay, now, now it gets exciting <laughs> because here's this tiny little pinpoint of life and yet the God of the universe, who seems to be far more interested in our opinion in just keeping the galaxies going, but the fact is, he's not. He is just as interested in every tiny, minute conception of life within every woman on earth, and he has been since the beginning of time. So I hope this would encourage any woman carrying a child today, because I'm convinced that there are always women who are pregnant who are some of them thinking, whoa, why me? Or why now? And especially during this crisis of the pandemic, oh, why did we have to get pregnant now? I want you to understand from this passage, God is vitally interested in that one who's come so soon on the heels of another child maybe, or one who was conceived during this pandemic. Notice verse 16, your eyes again referring to God, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. I love that phrase because it's the only time that word appears in the original Hebrew, the, translated in this Bible, unformed substance. It really refers to the embryo, not the fetus. I don't mean to be too technical again, but I think it is interesting because there is a Hebrew word that refers to a fetus in the womb. This one is unique it's used only here, and it means embryo. It's that earliest in instant stage of life when medical science says we're no, longer, we're, we're no larger than a period at the end of a sentence. And yet he says, God, in your majesty, your glory, in your heavens, you observe that tiny little speck. Your eyes have seen my earliest moment of life. In fact, in your book were written all the days 
that were formed for me, when as yet none of them existed. So he's covering life chronologically in its full. He goes all the way back to that embryonic state. And he says, when that moment of conception occurred, God, you saw, you were there, you were involved, and you began the knitting, the weaving, and all of that stuff, framing, working, fashioning, just like you wanted my body to be. And then he says, and at that very same moment, from my first moment of conception, God, you had already set up the days you had appointed for me, when as yet not one of them had started. From the time I entered life, and isn't it interesting how God declares life beginning, not at birth, but at the very moment of conception. Oh, I wish our society could learn that. And at that very moment of conception, God has mapped out, he has ordained, he has formed, fashioned, whatever words your Bible uses, every day of your life, even before you know one of them, even before we're born, even before we take our first actual breath of air. God not only determined how many days, but what shape those days will take. Because the word translated ordained in some Bibles, <clears throat> excuse me, formed in this translation, it's hard to know what to do with this Hebrew word. It's frequently used in the Old Testament to describe the activity of a potter with a lump of clay on his wheel. It's the word used in Genesis chapter 2 for when God formed man from the ground. You think of the potter, he's got a lump of clay, he puts it on the wheel, he begins to spin the wheel, and as the clay goes round and round, he forms or fashions that clay into whatever shape, a vase, a bowl, whatever. Whatever design he has in mind, he makes it out of that clay. That's this word. Hold your place here and go back to the previous book. We've done this before. Job chapter 14. When you get there, verse 1, you can sigh right along with it if you've had a tough week last week. As Job says in the 14th chapter of his journal, beginning right there at verse 1, this is Job talking, A mortal, born of woman, few of days, full of trouble. True, isn't it? Have you had a day like that? Had a week like that? You say, keep going. Okay, have you had a month like that, or now maybe two months like that? Maybe this whole year has been like that. Well, Job says life is like that. You, you will have your troubles. But look at verse 5. Still talking about us human beings. Since their days are determined, and the number of their months is known to you, God, and you have appointed the boundaries, and they cannot pass. I don't know if you're still wrestling with the sovereignty of God. I know when I grasped that truth of God's sovereignty a number of years ago and I really laid hold of it for the first time in my life, that became the most tremendous comfort to me of any truth in Scripture apart from my eternal security. When I began to realize that I was not having to work out every day and make it all happen the way I thought it should to make it come out right, I began to really understand what it meant to enjoy resting in the Lord and taking his yoke upon me. Maybe you feel like your life has been dealt a rather rigid hand from God. Maybe you feel like the deck's been sort of stacked against you. Well, this passage says the Lord has determined the number of your months and he set a boundary or a limit on those months that we are not to pass. And if we go back to Psalm 139, he even says in his book, they were all written down, the days he had set forth for us. Now, now think with me. If God is involved in preparing us from our unformed substance, the size of a pencil point, and then making our bony structure and our shape and our size as we sit on his potter's wheel, as it were, and if he is weaving together and embroidering our inward parts, as well as our personality, I don't think for one moment that God stops when you start to breathe. The God who began with you at conception never leaves you. Right on into and through birth, right on into and through death. And that's the thrill of this passage. How carefully has God made me? As carefully as any gifted artist does her or his work of embroidery, or needlework, or weaving, or pottery, or whatever. That's how carefully. 
And don't you think that when your days get difficult, something's gone wrong and the potter's wheel has stopped and he's gotten up and he's gone on to do something else. He is still intimately involved in your life. You're still being prepared. That's why the word ordained in some, verse, in some translations kind of miss it. Un, you know, uh, formed is a little bit better. There's just really no one English word that hits this fully. Just think of a potter working on a piece of clay until it takes the shape he wants. He pulls this, he moves that, stretches this, removes something. You really have to sit and watch a potter for a long time to appreciate everything they're doing. That's how God uses every day of our life. He's bringing about through these experiences whatever is necessary to perfect us into the very image of Christ. Do you remember what Paul said in his letter to the Romans in chapter 8, I believe it is, where he says, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Now please notice it doesn't say all things are good, at least humanly speaking. It says, actually literally what it says is, God causes all things to work together for good. And then it says, because those whom he foreknew, he predestined for what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the pattern that God has in mind for all of us. We have different heights, different weights, different hair colors, different eye colors, but one pattern is true for all of us. And that is, he wants us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate design for all of us on his potter's wheel. So when God brings you from an embryo to a fetus, from a fetus to a breathing infant, from a breathing infant into puberty, then into adult life, he is in the process of conforming you into the image of his son. And your troubles and your challenges and your difficult days are all simply part of that. This means that even with the trouble-filled times, you're just as important in God's plan to have those experiences as the days that it's kind of downhill sliding. Now in the last two verses of this section, the psalmist again just bursts forth with a similar exclamation as he did before as he says, boy, how weighty to me, verse 17, are your thoughts, O God. Not only are your workings mighty and awesome to me, not only are these days that you formed stretched pushed together. Not only are all those things amazing, but your, just your thinking, God, is so weighty and so precious to me. How vast is the sum of them? I, I try to count them. They're more than the sand. I come to an end. Well, here's where my comfort is. I am still with you. I see David tracing from the moment of conception to the actual end of life. When I come to the end of my life, and Lord, even at the end of life, I am still with you. You know what I see in verse 18? I see that God thinks about me a whole lot. And I see he does that about you. These have been trying days, haven't they? They've been uncomfortable days. They've been discouraging and frustrating days. God reminds us through a little bit of trial how frail we are. But he has designed this season for us. It's part of the potter's wheel for us. Even before the world was created, he knew this was going to happen. And from the moment you were conceived until this day, the 17th of May, 2020, he's been thinking about you a whole lot. That ought to encourage every person listening. You have been on God's mind. Now quickly, in our remaining moments, the last question the psalmist answers is, how much can I count on God to protect me? I mean, okay, I agree that God knows me. I agree I'm never out of his sight. I can't get away from his presence. And I'll even go so far as to agree that he was absolutely involved in a very intimate way in my creation. I wish I was taller. I wish I was shorter. But okay, I'll agree. But can I count on his protection? I mean, these days seem rather threatening in a way. And you know, like that favorite American non-verse, God helps those who help themselves. Don't I just have to make my best of this? Well, in verses 19 through 22, the psalmist actually answers this question, not by any statement, but by model. You see, he too is living in threatening times. If you read these verses, there are godless people all around him, people who speak maliciously about God. Verse 20 says there are, there are people who are rising up in defiance against him. 
So what does the psalmist do? Does he despair? Does he decide to compromise with the world around him? No, he prays about it. He takes all this to God. He takes every threatening concern to his God. Why? Because he knows God is his fortress. He knows that God is his defender. Let your eyes drop down to the very next psalm. It's mostly a, pr a prayer of petition about all of the threatening stuff going on around the, around the psalmist. Notice verse 7. He says, Lord, my Lord, you are my strong defender. You have covered my head in this day of battle. And if you go over to the 142nd Psalm, he says it again in verse 5, I cry to you, O Lord, and I say, you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. So give heed to my cry because I am brought very low. If you're feeling brought very low these days, do what the psalmist did. Cry out to the Lord. Tell him what's on your heart. You can count on him. How much? Fully. Now, does that mean I'll never have a problem? Well, of course not. I mean, again, notice what's going on in the life of David, whether in Psalm 139, 140, or elsewhere. There will always be threatening days. There will always be days, weeks, even months of hardship. There will always be times when the rug is absolutely pulled out from under you. But we can always count on the Lord to be our fortress, our defender, our rescuer. Not necessarily to immediately, instantly change our circumstances, but to be our, our deliverer. It'll be according to his time and his purpose. Because you know another thing Romans 8 does not say? It doesn't say that God causes all things to work together for good within 48 hours. It never says that. The timetable is open-ended because it's always according to his will and according to his purpose. And so we just have to keep trusting and keep praying. And then back in Psalm 139, to wrap this up, verse 23, the psalmist says now, in light of all of this and answering all four of these questions, Lord, search me. Same word as back in verse 1, dig down deeply into me and search me, O God. And when you do, know my heart, test me, and know my thoughts. Now, not know in the sense of learn what's there. We've already discovered God never learns anything. So the psalmist is not asking God to do this so that God will learn what's in his heart and what's in his thoughts. What's he doing? The psalmist is saying, Lord, you dig down deeply into my heart, into my thoughts, and show me what I need to learn about what's in there. Again, David's situation hasn't changed, just like ours hasn't changed yet. David is saying, so I need to change. You're waiting for the pressure to leave, but you're hemmed in. The pressure's not leaving. The shelter at home hasn't stopped. God is saying, you change. You fit the pressure. In fact, David says, see if there is any wicked way in me. The word wicked has been added by the translators here. Literally what this Hebrew phrase is, is way of pain. But that's hard to understand in English. But basically, see if there's anything about me that is painful, Lord. Painful to you as my God, or painful to others around me. Anything that would grieve your spirit, anything that would wound my fellow Christian, my family member, my friend. See if there is any painful way in me, and if there is, remove it, so that you can lead me in the way that is everlasting. Let me tie this up with a few lessons. One about our birth, uh, before our birth, the second at birth, the third after birth, and the fourth at death. First of all, before birth, our size, our shape, our structure, our color scheme, all designed by God. That's the first lesson. He made you just like he wants you. Whether you're six foot five and still in fourth grade, or whether you're five foot six and a full grown adult, there are no mistakes. God makes no mistakes. That's why Jesus said, who of you by worrying can add even an inch to your height? So quit worrying about how you look, how you're made. This passage says God designed you. Be joyful in that. Stop trying to change so much of it and be joyful in it. Before birth, you were designed by God. There's another lesson and it's about at birth. 
and that is there are no surprises, no accidents, no defects in the eyes of God. Now that's really going to stretch some, especially if you've experienced in your family or if you're living with what's called a congenital defect. But at birth, in God's eyes, there's no such thing as a defect. It's worth the look if you'll do it with me. You won't believe what you're going to see in Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, unless you're very familiar with this story. In Exodus chapter 4, this is where God is calling Moses to go be his agent of deliverance of the Hebrew people to bring them out of Egypt. And of course, Moses is giving the Lord every excuse he can think of as to why he shouldn't go. One of his excuses is, now, Lord, I, I, I don't, I, 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 well, Lord, I, I, I don't talk too good. Which is kind of ironic because he's been doing a lot of talking in this chapter. Well, the Lord tells him, Moses, I'm not asking you to be eloquent. Verse 11 of chapter 4. The Lord said to Moses, who gives speech to mortals? In fact, who makes them mute or deaf? seeing or blind, is it not I, the Lord? Now maybe you're thinking, oh, I, well, I don't know. I understand that. I mean, I don't know. How, how can a just and holy and righteous and merciful God actually cause somebody to be born blind or deaf? He says he does. In the sense of he takes responsibility for that. He could change it. He can make it different, but he says, I take responsibility for making you exactly the way I've made you. So even if Moses stuttered or had some speech impediment, what God is saying is, Moses, I made you that way. Stop using that as an excuse. Oftentimes parents feel if their child is born with a defect, what have we done? What have we done? The answer that I always point them to is found in John chapter 9, when the disciples of Jesus see a man who was born blind, and instantly they ask the Lord, Wow, Lord, who sinned? Was it the parents of this man or this man himself? And Jesus said, Neither. This man was born blind so that he might display the glory of God. How interesting to look at. It's not a defect. In the plan of God, it's a way for God to display his glory. In God's eyes, there's no such thing as an accident, a mistake, a defect, a surprise at birth. The third lesson, once we're born, from birth to death, all our days are designed with us in mind. That includes the heartaches. That includes the irritations. That includes what we call the dirty deals. That includes the times we were taking advantage of. That even includes the times that we're frustrated with restrictive lives lived in isolation. I mean, either that or our God isn't sovereign. So you see, there's no such thing as luck or fate or even misfortune. From God's point of view, again, there's no such thing. So if you still say that, and that's a hard habit to break if you've made it, well, good luck. Oh, I just have nothing but bad luck. I mean, what does that mean? Those days have been formed by God for you, ordained by God for you. So maybe instead of saying, oh man, what bad luck, how about saying, oh, look what God ordained. Look what God formed. Maybe you could say, instead of telling somebody, well, good luck, you could say, have a wonderfully ordained day. I know it sounds silly, but that's, that's God's point of view. There's no such thing as luck or fate or misfortune. And not until we really grab hold of that, is God going to be in the picture where he should be in the, in the picture from our perspective? The final lesson, at death, we are still in his care. When I wake up from death, so to speak, I am right there with him. Paul says it in the New Testament, to be absent from the body is to be where? Christian, it's to be face to face with the Lord Jesus. I mentioned last time how in Old Testament days, every person who died went to a place called Sheol. It was divided into two parts, one part for the righteous, one for the unrighteous. When Christ was his body in the tomb, his soul spirit went to Sheol and released all of the soul spirits that were in the righteous side. So today that side of Sheol is empty. 
And today, every Christian, the second they take their last breath on earth, they are instantly face to face with the Lord. Wow, what a great thing. Uh, I mean, you, you can't beat that insurance plan. There's not another plan that comes near this. You're covered from the moment of conception until beyond the grave. And you're reaping the dividends every day because God forms every day for you. When the so-called bad things bring, bring themselves into your life, it should cause you to praise his name. Oh, man, I, I'm encouraged by this. I, I hope you are too. Let's bow our heads. God knows you. God is near you. God made you. God protects you. God knows you. Do you know him? Now, don't give me a lot of tired old religious answers. Do you know him? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Do you know God? Have you come to God through Christ? The Bible says this is the record or the witness or the testimony that God has given us eternal life, but the life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has the life. Do you know God? Do you have Christ the Son? You see, God's longing is for his knowledge not to just be one way only. He wants us to know him. That's why he gave you a mind. He longs for you to know him. He longs for you to love him. That's why he gave you emotions. He longs for you to obey him. That's why he gave you a will. He longs for you to be near him. That's why he gave you a soul spirit. So if you've never done so, I invite you to accept his marvelous gift. It won't make you omniscient. It won't make you omnipotent. It won't make you omnipresent, but it will make you his child and it will place his spirit within you. So anyone listening today who's never asked Jesus Christ to come in and invade their life, you can do it right now. Just ask him to take away those sins and the guilt that accompanies them and receive his righteousness and his forgiveness and his grace. I may also speak this morning to some Christian who needs to confess that, you know, verses 23 and 24, they're the most important part of that whole psalm for me right now. It's been a long time since the scalpel of God went down into my soul and cut away the spiritual sickness that I've been clinging to. Some area of your life that you know grieves God and maybe wounds others. Why not bring that to Him? Let's just end by enjoying the Lord's presence for a moment. You ever thank God for your birth? Have you ever thanked God for your troubles or your misfortunes, the challenges? Have you ever credited those as opportunities to trust him? Let's take care of any and all of those things right now. It brings us such joy, our Father, such comfort to know that we've not been just thrown on a treadmill of time surrounded by mystery and riddles and enigmas that we're really the focal point of your attention. That you and we, all of these saints and I, we are linked together because of your personal attention and your love for us. Forgive us for the occasions when we're so short-sighted that we look at life just horizontally, humanly, selfishly even. We're undergoing some pretty difficult times, Lord, and I wouldn't make light of that for a moment. And then there are others whose lives have been terribly scarred. And so I pray that this encouraging portion of your word, more than anything I could ever say, that your word would lift their spirits. May we never forget how close you are to us, how well you know us, how personally you created us, and how lovingly you protect us. Father, we thank you for our birth, and we thank you for days like this that cause us to trust you all over again. Father, for anyone who has a lingering spiritual sickness, some way of pain, I pray that they would ask you to do, to do work on that, 
to remove that, to take care of that. And certainly, Lord, for anyone who's not yet in your family, and so they don't even have your spirit living within them, while they can't get away from your presence even so, they don't know you, and they need to know you. And I pray today would be the day they would come to know you personally through Jesus Christ, your Son. I pray all these things in the name of the Son. Amen. Thank you for joining us.